This episode of The History Guy brought to you by Mova Globes. Place them in the light, sit back and watch them spin, and be impressed. Stay tuned for a message at the end of the episode. On July 20th, 1969, at 10.56 p.m. Eastern Time, television images were broadcast worldwide as Neil Armstrong put his foot on the lunar surface. That one small step for man was a seminal moment in world and American history. It is seared in the national consciousness. It represented the greatest dreams of mankind made real via Yankee ingenuity. And yet that memorable moment wasn't the first Apollo mission. It wasn't Apollo 1. In fact, it was Apollo 11. And it really seems like Americans aren't terribly familiar with all those other Apollo missions that came before Apollo 11. Or for that matter, for those missions Apollo 12 through 20. In fact, it seems that one of the most memorable moments in American history is part of a program that is darned near forgotten history. There was much more to the program that led to man's first extraterrestrial steps than that first step, and among those missions, one is perhaps more forgotten even than the others because of coincidence of history. Apollo 6, the Apollo mission that almost failed, deserves to be remembered. The Apollo program was actually quite complex. There were 10 unmanned missions between 1961 and 1965, testing various Apollo program components using the Saturn I launch vehicle. Five used Jupiter nose cones and mostly tested rocket components. They were designated SA for Saturn Apollo 1 through 5. Five more tests using Saturn I rockets used boilerplate or simulated Apollo spacecraft to verify their launch aerodynamics. Those were designated AS 101 through 105. Three more launches in 1966 tested components of the command and service module using upgraded Saturn 1B rockets. They were designated AS-201 to 203. There were still more tests of Apollo escape systems, the so-called Little Joe 2 rocket as well. While news was following breathlessly at the time, I think it's fair to say most Americans today are generally unfamiliar with the host of launches that came before the officially designated Apollo. But even then, there is confusion. What would have been AS-204 had been the first of the missions to be manned by a crew, and so NASA employees instead colloquially called it Apollo 1. And disaster struck Apollo 1 on January 27, 1967. During a launch simulation designed to test power in the command module, a short an electrical arc started a fire. In the high oxygen environment, it spread quickly. Pressure inside the module made it difficult to remove the hatch from the inside, while flames and gases escaping through access panels slowed rescue attempts from the outside. Astronauts Gus Grissom, Edward White II, and Roger B. Caffey perished in the flames. In October 2013 edition of Popular Science Notes, the widows of the Apollo 1 crew asked that NASA retire the mission designation in honor of their husbands so that they might keep the flight that they never got to fly. NASA, of course, agreed. Apollos 2 and 3 were intended to be additional manned tests, but investigations due to the fire were resulting in significant redesign, and it didn't make sense to schedule tests of a version of the spacecraft that wouldn't be going to the moon. Apollos 2 and 3 were canceled. This left confusion in the designation system. Popular Mechanics writes, The agency could proceed in sequence and name the first mission after the fire Apollo 2, or could count the unmanned Saturn 1B test flights as part of the Apollo series and retroactively rename them to have Apollo designations. AS-201 would become Apollo 1A, AS-202 would become Apollo 2, and AS-203 would become Apollo 3. This meant subsequent flights following the fire would begin with Apollo 4. On April 24, 1967, NASA's Office of Manned Spaceflight announced that AS-204 would be officially recorded as Apollo 1. AS-201, AS-202, and AS-203 wouldn't be renumbered in the Apollo series, but subsequent missions would be named beginning with Apollo 4. Thus, there were no Apollo 2 or 3, and it would be some time before NASA would risk another manned mission. Apollo 4 was the first all-up test of the larger Saturn V rocket, taller than the Statue of Liberty and 13 times heavier, that would be used to take a mission to the moon, and the first Apollo mission to be launched from the Kennedy Space Center. Apollo 4 was to be an unmanned test to qualify the launch vehicle, the spacecraft, and the ground systems for the planned lunar landings to come. 
After several delays, the launch occurred on November 9, 1967. As the first test of the massive Saturn V rocket, it was a major press event with dignitaries watching the launch from bleachers. The massive rocket shook buildings throughout the space complex, much more than expected. The entire mission lasted just under nine hours from liftoff to splashdown. There were minor issues, but everything occurred within tolerance. President Johnson said, this launching symbolizes the power this nation is harnessing for the peaceful exploration of space. Apollo 5 was intended to test components of the lunar module. The unmanned mission did not require the expensive Saturn V and used the Saturn 1B rocket that would have carried Apollo 1. It launched January 22, 1968. Again, there were minor issues, but the mission was deemed a success. NASA's hopes were that Apollo 6 would be a notable last. Its objective was to fully qualify the Saturn V launch vehicles being able to carry an entire Apollo spacecraft all the way to the moon. Unlike Apollo 4, it would be fired for translunar injection. That is, it would prove that it could go all the way. Simply put, it was a dress rehearsal, a last test before NASA would again risk its astronauts. And if the mission succeeded, it would be the last unmanned mission of the Apollo program. NASA engineer Jay Green, who was the flight dynamics officer, explained in an interview in 2004, it was about a 12-hour flight intended to insert into Earth orbit much the way that we went on a lunar mission, and then it was going to do a full-up translunar injection, first time that had ever been done. But he noted this was very similar to Apollo 4, and everyone expected it to be a nominal mission. This time, however, the mission was just not that interesting to the public. The first launch of a Saturn V might have been a spectacle, but a second launch, still with no astronauts on board, just didn't garner much attention. Again facing delays, the launch was finally moved to April 4th. It received not a mention in the New York Times that day. Its front page was dominated by news of the war in Vietnam. The Tet Offensive had occurred just a few months before. It was a hectic time for news. On March 31st, President Johnson made the surprise announcement that he would not seek re-election. It did get mentioned in the Palm Beach Post on page A13. The Post reported NASA's goal for the mission to be a success. The rocket's three stages had to fire with precision to move the top stage and its payload into orbit. This third stage had to successfully orbit twice around the Earth. Its engine would have to then reignite and carry the rocket high enough to reach the moon. The module's rocket engine would then be used to act as a brake. It would then have to separate from its support module and position its heat shield for splashdown. The launch occurred at 7 a.m. from Launch Complex 39A at Kennedy Space Center. The official mission report says that the liftoff was normal, but during the S-1C boost phase, oscillations and abrupt measurement changes were observed. The NASA webpage explains, two minutes into the flight, the first stage experienced about 30 seconds of vertical oscillation known as pogo effect which caused no serious damage, but would have been very uncomfortable for any crew. NASA Administrator George Mueller later explained in a congressional hearing, Pogo arises fundamentally because you have thrust fluctuations in the engines. Those are normal characteristics of engines. All engines has what you might call noise in their output because the combustion is not quite uniform. So you have this fluctuation in thrust of the first stage as a normal characteristic of all engine burning. Now, in turn, the engine is fed through a pipe that takes the fuel out of the tanks and feeds it into the engine. That pipe's length is something like an organ pipe, so it has a certain resonant frequency of its own, and it really turns out that it will oscillate just like an organ pipe does. The structure of the vehicle is much like a tuning fork, so if you strike it right, it will oscillate up and down longitudinally. In a gross sense, it is the interaction between the various frequencies that cause the vehicle to oscillate. And so the rocket that was supposed to prove that it was ready to carry men to the moon had become a giant tuning fork. A NASA special publication called Moonport, a history of Apollo launch facilities and operations, noted that this would be a problem for a live crew as it produced unacceptable G-loads in the spacecraft. And that was just the start. Things were starting to fall off the spacecraft. Moonport continues. Simultaneously, the spacecraft lunar module adapter was experiencing trouble. Made of bonded aluminum honeycomb, the adapter not only housed the lunar module, but connected the command service module to the Saturn launch vehicle. At T plus 133 seconds, sizable pieces of the outer surface, more than three square meters, flaked off. And the report goes on, more was to come. Green describes what came next. We got to the second stage and we had a visiting booster engineer who was watching the flight and then over the airwaves I heard him say, that looks like two engines out. 
this could be a significant problem. Green explains. It turns out, per the flight rules, two engines out was supposed to be a loss-of-control case. But the rocket was able to compensate, burning the remaining three engines slightly longer, Green said. By the time the booster guys realized that we'd lost two engines, it turned out the vehicle was stable, and so we just let it fly. The question now is whether the rocket would achieve orbit. Green explained, the vehicle lofted and then got on third stage, and it started to drive straight at the Earth. Based on that, I had a limit line that we were approaching and had my sweaty little fingers on the abort switch. And the thing finally straightened out and it made it into orbit. Probably the first time we ever inserted into orbit, going backwards. Based on the way the guidance missed its target box and it just kept on trying until it got there. But the troubles didn't end there. After two trips around the Earth, the rocket on the third stage, the S-4B, was supposed to reignite. This was to prove the spacecraft, carrying approximately 80% of the load of a manned mission, could propel the craft to a translunar injection, a trajectory to reach the moon, although for this mission the rocket was to break before getting there. When the time came, however, the mission report says simply, an attempt to reignite the S-4B engine for the translunar injection firing was unsuccessful. Green said, everything looked copacetic, and we came up on translunar injection and counted down, and S-4B engine was supposed to light, and it never lit. With translunar injection out the window, mission engineers decided to simply bring the mission home, switching to, essentially, the mission profile of the previous Apollo 4 mission. Green explained, so I got to throw my little switch that separated the spacecraft from the booster, and we went on and completed a semi-nominal mission. The capsule splashed down approximately 10 hours after liftoff, 43 nautical miles from its planned touchdown point, and was picked up by the amphibious assault ship, USS Okinawa. NASA Director Samuel Phillips said in a post-mission statement, There is no question that it's a less-than-perfect mission. This, of course, raised concerns, as the mission was supposed to be the final proof that Apollo was ready to send men to the moon. Mueller was quoted in the New York Times, We are all disappointed. This will have to be defined as a failure. You might think that the failure of Apollo 6 would be big news, given the importance of the Apollo program and the attention that had been paid to Apollo 4 the previous November. But if LBJ's announcement and the Vietnam War had conspired to keep Apollo 6 off of the front pages on April 4th, on April 5th, few Americans were thinking about the space program. The headline of the New York Times that day read, Martin Luther King slain in Memphis. In turbulent times, the last unmanned mission of the Apollo program was virtually missed by an American public that was distracted and suddenly in mourning. It became, almost instantly, nearly forgotten history. You might imagine that the multiple issues would have given NASA pause on again risking a manned mission, but the result was almost the opposite. Phillips instead described the problems with the mission as a major unplanned accomplishment. Instead of proof that the system was unready, the mission had demonstrated that the second stage could successfully function even with two of its five rockets cutting off early, and that even with multiple errors, NASA could bring the capsule safely home. NASA was convinced that they could solve the problems of the pogo wing and the engines that cut off early or didn't start and decided that another unmanned mission was unnecessary. Green said, so we had three engines out in this aborted profile, we ran an approximation of a nominal entry, and everything went so well that we man-rated the Saturn V based on that. And the next time we used a rocket, we went to the moon. Apollo 7 is, well, another mission that's largely forgotten. But that is a story for another time. If you're a fan of the History Guy, then I'm sure you've seen these amazing globes on my set, like this highly detailed, topographically accurate globe of the moon based on topographical photos taken by NASA. And that's right, it spins all by itself. No batteries, no wires, powered just by ambient light and the Earth's magnetic field. These are called MOVA globes, and their first of its kind technology allows them to rotate merely by exposure to ambient light. And they come in over 40 designs. You know, these things are just Cool. Not only do they spin by themselves, but they have amazing detail. And if you put one on your desk, I guarantee you it will be a subject of conversation. And the best part is that History Guy viewers get a special discount. 10% off 6-inch and 8.5-inch globes. All you need to do is use the code THEHISTORYGUY on mobaglobes.com. 
I hope you enjoyed this episode of The History Guy. Check out our community on thehistoryguyguild.locals.com, our webpage at thehistoryguy.com, and our merchandise at teespring.com, or book a special message from The History Guy on Cameo. And if you'd like more episodes on Forgotten History, all you have to do is subscribe.